This is Ray Hoffman. Nathan Latka has answered the previously unanswerable, How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital. That's the title of his new book. It's a book filled with insight and good information. It's based on his experiences over the last 10 years. And to show you how useful it is, and not just for millennial readers, as some people might su suggest, you might want to take a look at all these let me see. Are these real notes, Ray, or are these fake notes? These you know, are not a fake notes. Let's yes. see. Let's yeah. see a real note. There we go. All of, yeah, sure. I've got notes all the way through here. <laughs> My check marks and brackets and underlines and circles all through it. So welcome, as I set this thing up. There. How about that? Welcome to the Radio.com Theater and Author Talks and CEO Radio Nathan Latka. Ray, thank you so much for having me. You have how many businesses and or investments today? Defines, uh, d yeah, I was going to say, it depends on how you define it. So probably about 30, 40, something in that range. And how many over the last year? I want to say about maybe a dozen. Now, as I was reading this book, I was thinking that I wish I could have read this in my 20s or 30s or 40s mm -hmm. or 50s. But part of the point of this book is that those opportunities didn't exist until right. you came along. That's right. Well, there was a lot of pushback. We were very fortunate to do this book with Portfolio Random House, and you have a lot of authors on. You know, they like to put out books that are timeless, that will be selling, you know, 10, 20 years from now. So this book we jam-packed with tax returns on page six, a six and a half million dollar acquisition offer I turned down on page 243 when I was 21, email scripts that I use to connect with people like guest bloggers to get extra exposure. And so these screenshots won't work two, three years from now. It is not a timeless book, Ray. It's an urgent book that the first person who really buys has the biggest advantage. So congratulations. You've read it. you got a big advantage. First mover advantage. <laughs> and in the back also, very useful thing, all the different listings of entrepreneurial groups and, uh, and, and websites and so forth. So extremely valuable for this moment. You make the point that your, uh, your go-to business book growing up, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yes, well, bestseller year after year in the 1990s, hit. 2000s. Now you say the book is no longer valid. And this made me very sad because, I mean, I grew up with that beautiful purple cover and the cash flow quadrants. I mean, you know the drill. Mm -hmm. So what happened was I remember reading, right, him, Robert Kiyosaki talk about how your home, right, if you buy it and you have a mortgage payment, is a big liability. That was in the liability part of the cash flow quadrant. And so when I was living in Blacksburg, Virginia, studying architecture as a student in the nicest apartment, it was the most expensive apartment in Blacksburg, above the downtown theater. It was called the Lear Theater. And I was able to rent out a corner of my apartment for more than my total rent on the space. So I was making money. I was living like a king without spending a dollar. How did I do that? How did I turn my home, which Robert of Rich Dad Poor Dad would define as a liability, into an asset? Well, the answer is Airbnb, which didn't exist back then. The development of that. The yeah. development of Airbnb. So, and there's obviously, we know a lot of controversy about Airbnb, but the point is there are, there are hundreds of tactics like this that you guys can now use, whether you're at home, you're stuck in a corporate job and you want to launch something on the side, or you've already ventured out, Ray, and they've gone out on their own already and want to make an extra income with some side hustle. The book's packed with those strategies. So I had to write the book when my childhood favorite really became dated and I think irrelevant to be. To, maybe from a thinking perspective, the book is still relevant, but from a tactics, you know, your house is no longer a liability. You can turn it into a big asset. Yeah. Let's flip the question now. Are there any old economy lessons that you learned growing up that are still valid in terms of what you do? This is a great question. So um, my parents, my household was flipped. My dad was a coal miner. And, a, and then stayed at home, he was a stay-at-home dad, while he also worked for the United States Postal Service. And my mom was like a double, triple entrepreneur in pharmaceutical consulting and real estate companies. So I had the, you know, the luxury of seeing this kind of flipped household. And you know, one of the things that, that, that they taught me as I was growing up, which I think is still relevant today, is they never told me no. Uh, they never really shut down an idea I had. But when in their brain, in their head, when I said, Mom, I want to go to, you know, uh, take the, you know, go out to Pizza Hut tonight. She would say, well, Nathan, you have a choice. If we go to Pizza Hut tonight, you can't have your friends over tomorrow night because they both cost money, so you have to pick one. And so I sat, and I remember I asked her in the back seat of our blue minivan, I said, okay, let me think. And then I said, Mom, if I 
dig into my piggy bank and pay for the family to go to pizza? Can I still have people over tomorrow night? And I remember my parents sitting in the front seat laughed and said, okay, honey, we'll go, to, we'll go to Pizza Hut and you can still have friends over. The lesson was taught, right? You don't want to shut down ideas before you try them. There are no wrong answers, which made me an extremely curious young one. And I'm still curious today. And that's why I've got 40 different income streams. Mm -hmm. are, you on, are you an only child? No, I've got actually five. So get this, my dad is actually older than my grandma on my mom's side, obviously. So does that make sense? Dad? I know you're good with numbers and, and math, but I don't get that at all. D D Dad is 23 years older than my mom. So I'm gonna age well is what that means. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my point in saying this is I got basically generational knowledge, different generations from both different parents, and this was such a great asset for me to have. Yeah. I mentioned that I was doing this interview to a friend of mine last week, and he sneered and said, trust fund baby. Yeah. When he saw the idea how to be a capitalist without any capital. Not so. You're the new rich, and if that isn't already a demographic term, it has to be one soon. Well, Ray, I'll tell you what. I'm hoping I still become a trust fund baby. Maybe there's something hidden out that I don't know about yet, and <laughs> someone dies, and boom, I become a trust fund baby. I would love, trust me, I would love being a trust fund baby. Now, I will say this. I'm not a trust fund baby. I did start with no capital. But I also have a major advantage, right? I was a white male born in North America in maybe the greatest country on earth to parents who were middle income. I never had to worry about food on the table. I never had to worry about a house to you know, sleep under. So I did have these advantages, which not everyone is blessed with. So I joke and say, I do maybe have you know, white, you know, white male privilege, but I wanna use that privilege for good before I lose it. And so a lot of the tactics I've put in this book, I've thought really hard about if, I, if, if someone's reading this, that did not have these privileges, would they still work? And the resounding answer we're seeing via Amazon reviews is yes. Yeah, you write in the book that you're obsessed with numbers and data, and yet you failed a statistics test, at least one of them, at Virginia Tech, and then you dropped out to become one of those new rich. Yes, well, this is because I heard a big, beautiful, now I can't mimic it, but it sounded like a kind of a ding, 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 and what that was, now, Ray, where did you go to college? Penn State. Okay. You remember when you walk in to take the exam? Now, did you have Scantrons, or how did you take tests? Scantrons? No Scantrons. <laughs> they were we just... had something that looked a lot like this, where you actually wrote things out. And like stuff. with a pencil or with something? With a pencil, oh, yeah, my yeah, right. Radical concept. Yeah, stylus, actually, in the stylus. early days. Yes. Don't say Palm Pilot. I yeah. uh, hope they're not a sponsor. But um, my point is, when you go into the colleges now to take exams, you have to put your phones and backpacks along the wall before you go to your seat to try and they prevent cheating to do this. Well, the night before the statistics exam... We didn't even have backpacks. No backpacks. <laughs> Holy. Go well, ahead now. They, that's a, that's, I don't know how you manage. Uh, no backpacks. But we put all of our stuff along the side, and the night before, I had, I had emailed a few people trying to pre-sell my first idea, which was a Facebook fan page for $700. And I set up a special ding on my phone where anytime I got a PayPal kind of inbound money send, it ding. Well, as I was filling out the Scantron, sweating bullets in that statistics class, it dinged twice, which means I made $1,400 while I failed. And that's when I looked at myself and I said, school is not for me, I'm dropping out. And that was the end of that. And you contend there are four old adages about business. You call them four lies that you need to forget. I don't know if I'd call them lies, but you say you need to forget them if you wanna be part of the new rich. Focus on becoming an expert at one thing. Don't do that. Come up with a remarkable idea. Don't do that. Set goals and work toward them. No. And give customers what they want. Four lies that you need to forget if you want to be part of the new rich. Instead, you have five new rules. Well, your audience is listening to you say that, and you guys are watching my body language, and you're thinking, wait, no, no, these are all things I live by. I was, I was taught these things. What do you mean I have to break these to become part of the new rich? Well, Ray, this is the problem, and I'm gonna use a political example. Anytime someone in any country gains power, uh, they tend, you know, the ladder they climb to gain that wealth or power, in order to protect themselves at the top, they have to complicate that path so no one else can climb the same ladder. 
So the wealth and the powerful today have essentially invented these four rules, sold it to the broke masses, and have convinced us to stay basically where we are, not accelerate at a wealth level or from a power perspective to compete with these people by, again, living by these rules. I quickly realized I've got nothing to, to lose. I'm gonna test breaking them, and it's worked out well for me. So again, these rules, it makes sense why they exist, but they're wrong, and I'm happy to dive into any of them that interests you. Okay, number one, don't focus on one thing. Yes. Don't no. focus on one thing. Not one thing. You know, there are great books by a lot of my friends, Greg with Essentialism. We've had the Keller Williams team with The One Thing. Maybe you've heard of these books. This is a very popular headline. Only do one thing. What's the saying about jack of all trades or master of none, this kind mm -hmm. of thing. In today's age, the problem is masters can be replaced. So you better be a jack of all trades and understand a lot of different things so you can find the masters in those trades and unite them around a goal. And that's way more powerful. Now, the, the second analogy I give is our economy is just more global today, right? As Friedman would say, the world is flat. And in a flat world, you've got to be able to move quickly. So if I asked you, Ray, we're driving together after this, let's say this goes well and we become best friends, and we're driving here in New York over a bridge, but the bridge says before we go over it, hey, warning, this bridge, if, if winds pass 20 miles per hour, it has a single point of failure, it will crack and fall. Now, if there was even a slight breeze that day, Ray, we'd think twice about driving over that bridge, it might fall. We're taking the tunnel. We're taking the tunnel. So here's the thing. We build our lives. By the way, bridges have like eight, nine, 10 points of failure like that have to go wrong at the same time for a bridge to be compromised. So why do most people build their lives around a single point of failure? Whether it's one job, focusing on one thing, or doing one thing really well. It's not a smart strategy in today's world. And do you say focus on three opportunities simultaneously, and if nothing else, you get your reps in the batting cage? That's exactly right. Just like baseball, you've got to swing. You don't want to see a perfect strike pass you by, and you're not swinging because you're distracted by the one thing you thought was important. The fact is, many people don't know what's going to win for them. So the trick is, is to juggle as much as you can, see what gains momentum, and then double down. Your second rule is copy your competitors, and you quote Picasso, good artists can copy, great artists can steal. This is right, and I don't know why people don't give themselves permission to do this, but if you're watching right now, I guarantee you, you've seen a competitor, and you're going, wow, that's a great idea, and you have the ability to copy them aggressively, quickly, and efficiently, but you don't. And Ray, the question is why? That competitor has spent a lot of their own money, and their time learning, right, going through mistakes, why would you not take advantage of that? Why would you go spend your own money, spend your own time to make the same mistakes? So people have to give themselves permission to copy aggressively, and once they copy, then add their own twist to get an advantage. Facebook does this, they rip off Insta, uh, Snapchat, right, over and over again. Steve Jobs copied directly out of Xerox Labs on the Lisa and many products. People have to copy to win. Yeah, that was one of the, the most compelling chapters in the book, I thought. Why, now, why was that? Because you felt like it was the thing that was most controversial? No, not because it was most controversial. I'll bring that up in a minute. Okay. Most contro controversial, no, but most uh, eye-opening for me. I mean, I'm aware of that concept, but I, I really didn't see it delineated in quite the way you did, so I congratulate you. Rule three I want to get to, quit setting goals because they're keeping you broke. Yes. <laughs> you know, I laugh and people do what you just did when they say this because there are, again, books on goal setting and set great goals, but goals are very, very dangerous because corporations spend trillions and trillions of dollars to get our minds and our bodies and our energy focused on a goal. And then what do we do? We work one job, we save a little from every paycheck until we can buy that $20,000 Rolex watch we saw Roger Federer wearing at Wimbledon, which Rolex paid a million dollars for that sponsorship for. Or finally being able to purchase that Versace dress that we love because we saw Kim Kardashian wearing it. Or, t now, I hope you're not, uh, maybe not, well, no, no. But going on the vacation we want, right? Buying the car we want, these are goals. What's way more effective, Ray, is to invest in the system that will produce these goals over and over again. This is kind of the difference between enjoying the process versus just only enjoying and being happy if you get the outcome you want. And the way you should think about that is a golden goose is laying these goals, the golden eggs. Most Americans, and the net worth, average net worth is negative 4,000 bucks, so if you want to be rich, you can't be average, right? They focus on the golden eggs. It's way more important to keep the golden goose well-nourished, happy, healthy, and working efficiently so they can pump out more goals. And there's a time-consuming chase that's involved 
toward those goals, and that's another factor in, that runs through your book. Well, I don't know if you will believe this from the book, but I'm actually an extremely lazy individual. I pride myself on a blank calendar. I think, guys, when you have a blank calendar, when news happens right now, you can act very quickly to take advantage of that news. Versus if you have to work a nine to five or your calendar is packed because you have to put dinner you know, on tonight or you have expenses, you can't react to real time news. And Ray, that's a disadvantage because wealthy people are reacting real time. And usually, first people to move make the first amount of money. Yeah. And the new economy provides freelance talent from all around the world, which, which is so important in terms of removing that time-consuming chase. You know, all the people who can make your personal system operate more efficiently, the, the websites like Fiverr and TopTel. I know about Fiverr because yep. I sometimes use that for audio projects. But reading through the book, I, I saw the names of one website after another that I'd never heard of, breather.com, thumbtack.com, snapper.co, recharge.co, and dozens of others. Now, this may be a generational thing, but where do you find these companies? Well, I don't know if it's generational. I think you're a pretty hip and cool guy. I mean, you're rocking a plaid suit here right now. That's impressive. <laughs> now, let me tell you, these websites, you know, there's ones like Turo.com, T-U-R-O. They mm -hmm. help you rent your car when you're not using it. A lot of you guys, if you commute to work, your car sits in a parking garage. Yeah. What if you can make 100 bucks a day by renting it out? Turo helps you do that. Th these, these things are about, these websites I provide are about turning things you thought were liabilities, sucking cash from you, into assets, which bring you cash. One of my favorites, you mentioned is recharge. When I fly in for a day trip to San Francisco because I'm working on a big deal and I land from a red eye from the East Coast, I can basically buy with recharge.com two hours in a hotel room, which allows me to shower, get a quick nap, and then leave. And it's cheaper than getting the hotel room for the night, which I don't need. So there's all these little hacks like this throughout the book. Yeah. Well, where do you find out about them? Well, I find out via my podcast called The Top Entrepreneurs. We've interviewed about two, 3,000 software CEOs. And one of my questions I'd like to ask at the end is, Ray, what is your favorite tool right, for gaining wealth or building your business? Yeah, and so I get, ask it. Yes. Yeah, so I get tons of tools like this. I collect them and then test them. Let's go to rule four. Yeah. Sell pickaxes to gold miners. Selling pickaxes is better than selling liquor? Well, I don't, did you say it didn't end selling liquor? Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. I think if I had the choice between liquor and, you know, good rum and a pickaxe, I'd pick the rum every time. But uh, I'm a big jeans fan. Are you a big jeans fan, Levi jeans? Levi jeans. Worn them all my life. Worn them all your life, right? Now, this story started back in the 1800s when Mr. Levi went west and mm -hmm. said, I want to be a gold miner. Chase the hot thing. And he gets down in these trenches. He's digging for gold. He's sweating. He's getting cut up. He's dirty. He says, this, this, I have to get very lucky to win here. So he said, but I see everyone wearing these like durable pants they're trying to make. I'm going to just sell jeans to the gold miners, right? Or sell the pickaxes to the mm -hmm. gold miners. Now Levi's is probably the, you know, very, very successful brand. So the lesson here is today, go refresh any news site, any headlines you see, listen to what they're talking about, but go on the, go to the part of the iceberg that's floating under the water, Ray. People need to see the different things they can sell that yeah. support today's hot thing. Don't compete in the hot thing because there's no margin to make money there. It's perfectly competitive. And I think this is a very valuable book also for anyone thinking about investing in real estate. You make two really good points. Knocking on the door gets a better price and you only buy within 10 miles of a college. Let's go a little deeper into that. Well, the college one was just by necessity, right? I grew up and I was living in Blacksburg, Virginia at Virginia Tech, and I said, I don't want these you know, people that own the places to try and charge me a lot. So I remember waking up, I sh and I had dropped out at this point. So I was trying to look younger. I shaved, I put on a Virginia Tech t-shirt and a little jacket, mm -hmm. and I started door knocking. And I came up to this one place right on Odie Street in Washington, I knocked, and here was my script. I looked at them, they opened the door, and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm a student here. I really need a place to lease for the semester. Do you have any spots available? Now, the trick here is, Ray, I won no matter what the response was. So if they said yes, they've got a, a room to lease, not I'd good. say, not, well, not good, right? Because that mm -hmm. means there's vacancies and the owner's not making money on that vacancy. So I'd ask, well, can you connect me to the owner? I'd love to potentially rent that room. If they said, no, sorry, we're full, I'd look at them and say, well, can you connect me to the owner so I can maybe, you know, get in next year? <laughs> So, Ray, what was I after no matter what? The, the owner's email, yeah. right? the owner's phone number. And so I took this guy out. He was the owner of the Odie Street and Washington property. Took him out to a little coffee shop in Blacksburg and said, hey, tell me about this place. And he goes, well, Nathan, it's owned by my charity. We really want to actually sell it. The mortgage is paid off. Uh, and we ultimately ended up getting a price from him. And so I bought it without having to use a realtor. 
right? And now that place cash flows for me about $1,000 a month, totally passive income from about a $10,000 cash investment. What was this back in 2012, 2013? Yeah, all these years now. All yeah. these years. Yeah. Now, what deals do you shave for? And conversely, are there deals that are done best with stubble? Well, listen, the stubble deals are the ones where you feel like people will value experience because they'll assume if you look older, you have more wisdom, which, as we know, is not always the case. Uh, mm -hmm. Flip that in reverse. If someone's looking for someone that they want to be younger, maybe a social media coordinator or something they associate with millennials, you'd shave and try and look younger and get an advantage. Yeah, yeah. Now, it helps if you have a big social media following, which you do. But if you don't, you say go out and buy an Instagram account with lots of followers. Well, this is very controversial. Instagram may not like that we're talking about this, but I will make them happy here and tell them what I did instead really was I bought a company, right, that owned an Instagram account. And so what the reason I did that is I was planning a 45-day trip to Bali, to Thailand, and I said, you know what, um, I want to figure out if there's a way that I can get this stuff for free. And I had heard these influencers getting stuff for free. So Ray, I spent $3,000, right, to buy an Instagram account along with the business. And this was your first attempt to get stuff for free. This was my first, one of my first attempts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was another one related to a Rolls Royce, which I can talk about. <laughs> yeah. It was a fun one. But ultimately, I ended up trading one for one Instagram posts for beautiful stays in Bali hotels. And in the book on page 101, I actually have the email script of how I reached out to these hotels and got the free stays. If I paid retail, I added this up, if I paid retail for the hotel stays, the $9,000 first class flights, my total expenses would have been about 45,000 bucks. So by buying the $3,000 Instagram account, I saved $43,000. And this brings us to the critical skill of negotiating. Where does that skill in you come from? Uh, this is a great question. I have no, I think it's because my parents never gave me an allowance. So I'd spend every waking moment when I was young trying to convince them to give me an allowance, uh, yeah. potentially. But um, this is just something I learned over time. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure quite how I learned it, but I will tell you it's super effective. You know, when I was going out and selling my first company, or one of my first companies, it was Heyo. You know, we put the, we basically published what our income was so that people knew what asset was that we were sitting on. And, you know, again, I want to be very transparent in the book because I think transparency is key. But we put the, we put the income statement in the book, and uh, actually you can see it right here, right? So that's the income statement, page six. And you see $939,000 in sales in that particular year. And I said, you know what? We really don't need to sell the company right now, which makes it, Right, the perfect time to reach out and see if we could get someone on the hook to buy it because I knew I could walk away. And so what I did is I collected all of the emails right, of the business development people at our number one competitors and I sent them an email that said, sorry, I'm shutting the company down. Now, most people, M&A advisors would tell you, you want your company to be bought, not sold. You want to be in demand. You want them chasing you. So it's actually totally reverse conventional wisdom to basically say, we're in trouble, please come buy me. But here was my thinking. Have you bought a company before, Ray, or been involved in M&A negotiations ever? Never. Okay, so part of, the rate, part of the thing that these BD guys have to do, and gals, is they have to sell their boards on the, getting the capital from the company to go buy me. So the second they would go back to their boards and say, hey, our number one competitor is shutting down. We could get them for a discount, right? If they get approval for that, they then give me something called a letter of intent or an LOI. And the second I get an LOI, they are then emotionally invested in the deal. And they get egg on their face if they don't actually follow through and buy me. So this was, I'm gonna hold this up. This was the email. I don't know if you guys can see this. We put this in the book, page 78. I said, shutting Heyo down. And I sent this out to a bunch of the BD folks. And Ray, here's a little bit about what it said. Hey. The team and I have been focused on a totally unrelated opportunity for the last nine months, and it's growing fast now. We've decided to shut down Heyo.com as a result. It's a distraction. Are you interested in the assets? We did 600 grand in top line revenue last year, 10,000 customers. And so one of them wrote back, and he said, Nathan, we did some back of the napkin estimates, and we think we could get you north of $500,000 for the company, which was way too small. We wouldn't sell for that. That was last, less than 1x ARR, annual recurring revenue. But what I did is I wrote back and I said, this is a great offer. We'd love to do a deal. Can you formalize it in a letter of intent? Again, get their ego attached. So Ray, this was like a Monday. And by Wednesday, I had eight of those companies with an LO, they'd give me an LOI. All that price is way too, I wouldn't accept. So I wrote all of them back and I said, hey, I have, and you guys can use this, this is a trick. 
You say, I have two responsibilities, financial and to my customers. I want a good financial deal, and I want to make my customers happy. Now, this is a great offer. I would love, you're gonna make my customers very happy. They'd be a perfect landing for you. But my board and my advisors will look at me and tell me this is an embarrassing financial offer. And I would end with these five words. Is this your best offer? Enough to plant a seed of doubt mm -hmm. that they might lose me, because it's not good enough. Well, of the eight, Ray, four of them wrote back and doubled their price. And I said, well, heck, these five words just made me a lot of money. I should use them again until they wear out. So what did I do that Wednesday with the LOIs? I wrote all four and said, hey, I have a financial responsibility and a, and a customer responsibility, same script. Is this your best offer? I'm making a decision on Friday. And then what do you think happened with those four, Ray? Well, two of them basically gave me the finger because they realized what I was doing. And they said, screw you, we're moving on. Now the other two doubled their price. Right. So great, I had two people, I had 4X their price, it was a great price, and you guys can see what this actually looked like, and I love this, this is on page 243, and you nodded when I mentioned this earlier. Page 243, this is an LOI, and you can see here from my contact, it says the purchase price will be $6.5 million, and will be paid in the following manner. So I went from a $500,000 offer <laughs> to a $6.5 million offer. And this was back in 2011, so I would have been 21 years old. But that's, this is an idea, this is a microcosm of how to negotiate when you don't have to. That's when you have the most leverage. Because I walked away from even the $6.5 million, $6 million offer. Yeah, always that's the time of leverage. Now I want to bring up the thing that I found most controversial in the book. Might make some people who read this look at you in a less than positive light. Because you say the first thing you need to do when you buy a company is to double the pricing. Yes. And that rings of Martin Shkreli or something to well, me. Well, I was very nervous. I thought you were gonna say it was my comb over or something. So this is gonna be easy. <laughs> Doubling pricing, you know, most people value their product. The way they get the pricing model is they say, what's it cost to me? And they add a couple dollars. This is such a bad way to do pricing because you, as a human being, add so much unique talent to your product. You deserve to be paid more. Now this is very different than a drug company, which has no competition for an insulin injection. And when they have a monopoly, they can inject the prices up from 100 bucks per shot to 10,000 per shot. That's not what I'm talking about. My tool went from being free to $5 a month. And so what happened was this tool that Ray is referencing that I purchased, I purchased for $1,000. It had 30,000 active users. Once I purchased it, I said, I only want to even put pricing Ray in front of 5% of the user base, because I didn't want to make anyone mad. So the way I picked which 5% to put it in front of is I just measured. I said, who is most active? Who is using the tool the most? And that's who I'll show pricing to. So Ray, I launched the pricing pop-up for $5. It had a button that said, click here to pay, or they could click a button that said, keep using for free one more time. Well, my conversion rate on that pop-up was 97%. So if 100 people saw it, 97 would start paying. So today, that tool's done over $140,000 in sales just from adding that one pop-up on my initial investment of $1,000. Now that's a good return. Yeah, justifying the doubling of the pricing. Two years ago, more than a million people watched you live on Facebook doing an investment in a food truck, Ming's Yummy Thai Food. What was the reason behind both going live on Facebook to do that? Was it just brand building and then making the deal? Well, going live on Facebook uh, was a risk, right? Because you have no idea what can happen when you're live. But ultimately what I did is I walked up to Ning's Yummy Thai Food Truck in Austin. I turned on my camera and I said, hey, Facebook, I have my checkbook. I wanna find a company to go buy. And they'd say, go to the grilled cheese food truck. Go to you know, the Yummy Pad Thai. So I landed on Ning's, and uh, there's this, you know, we'll, we'll, we can get some roll here, but this is Ning up close in her food truck. You can see 1.2 million people watched. And ultimately what I did is I, I ordered one of her Pad Thai's, said this is delicious, tell me more about the business, I wanna help. Well she told me she was doing 600 meals per month. Uh, Ray, she told me she immigrated from Thailand, launched this business and wanted to create additional jobs. And I said, I can help her out. I said, what's your biggest expense? And she said, well, Nathan, I pay 600 bucks a month right now for the loan on the food truck. And I said, Ning, what's the food truck cost? How much do you have left? And she said, $6,000. And I said, done. Got out my checkbook, wrote a $6,000 <laughs> check, but I'm a capitalist. I don't give away money. I'm not a charity. So here's how I got my money back. I said, Ning, you have to pay me back 75 cents per meal until I'm paid back. 
and then 10 cents per meal in perpetuity. And I'm proud to say on page 194, you see all the dividend checks that Ning has written to me. I made my $6,000 back in about eight months. I helped her triple her meal volume by getting her a better location for her food truck because I knew who owned the real estate. And now she's growing and creating jobs. Ray, I love doing deals like this. That's a, yeah, it's a great story. And for anyone looking to do a similar out of left field story, you've got a great, you've got a great idea put it out on your Facebook status page that you're willing to invest $5,000 in something. A lot of people think if they have $5,000 laying around, it should go into like an S&P index fund or something like that. And what I would tell you guys watching is, unless you're at Goldman or you went to Harvard and you have you know, some you know, rah-rah degree, you don't have any advantage by putting your money in the stock exchange. Somebody else here in New York has better data, better information, and can move faster than you. Well, if you're investing in an index fund, you're growing with the market, though. Well, if the market's growing. Okay. If the market's growing. And as we know today, the market is doing all kinds of interesting things that you and I have very little control over. I like putting my money over things that I have total control over. You guys have control over things, you just don't know it. Pad Thai. Pad Thai. <laughs> the best place to start for anyone wanting to invest is to look at where they go every day already. A coffee shop, their dog trainer park, whatever it is, and meet the owner and see if you can give them money to help them grow. That's the best place to make your first investment. Now, one of the keys to the success of your Top Entrepreneurs podcast is how you do your interviews and how you pry detailed financial information out of privately held companies that don't want to tell you anything, monthly recurring revenue, et cetera, et cetera, and then you sell that precious data to other companies. You know what I'm thinking? You would have made a great district attorney. <laughs> Getting well, all those people to confess, I did it, I did it, right there on the witness stand. It is a little like that. The difference is the district attorney can fight when they're sued. I'm the most sued podcaster because boards hear their CEOs <laughs> tell me all their data, and you know what they do? Blah, 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 blah. Cease and desist, Nathan Lackett. Take the show down. And I say, sorry, your CEO signed this big, beautiful agreement that I have rights to all the audio before they came on. So what happens is, yeah, it's a 15-minute daily show. I get the CEOs on. And I say, what's your valuation? How much money are you raising? When are you going to IPO? What's your revenue per employee? Very sensitive information. And Ray, the reason I do it is because I haven't seen anybody else get this kind of sensitive data. And I'm a numbers guy. I've never gotten it. I want the numbers. We want the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Numbers don't lie. I'll ask them, you know, and they'll <laughs> say, oh, I can't reveal that. Yes. You know? And you say, well, why can't you reveal this? Right? I mean, you just, I push very hard. Yeah, and I they get very, yeah. it sounds like you've listened. So you, oh, yeah. maybe you know, some of them get very uncomfortable, but mm -hmm. it's entertaining then. And that's why people listen. Oh, yeah. You badger them pretty good. <laughs> and software as a service. SaaS companies are the ones that interest you the most, right? That's right. You know, Software as a service, if you're going to pick any business to go into, you want to, and assume every business line is an ATM, you want to pick an ATM that spits out five bucks for every dollar you put in versus only a dollar for a dollar in, right? Well, SaaS is just a great ATM. I mean, we see Slack just filed the IPO. We've seen a lot of software companies IPO recently, and their private, you know, their PE multiples are through the roof, some of the highest. You can just look at Salesforce. And so the reason that happens is because software as a service is recurring subscription revenue. When you can predict revenues, you can predict growth. And when you can predict growth, people are more likely to give you a higher valuation because they can discount cash flow, basically do a DCF, a discounted cash flow model, on your future revenue streams to value you today. So I love software as a service companies. And if you're going to be a billionaire, it'll be because of SaaS more than anything else, One, right? 100%. Yeah. Now, on your podcast, you close each interview with your famous five. Uh-oh. Five rapid-fire questions. Yes. In the spirit of that, are you ready for the Inspired Eight? Oh, here we go. Give it to me, Ray. I hope no. they're not easy. Okay. Well, some of them are. <laughs> First, your favorite business book not named How to Be a Capitalist Without Any Capital. By far, Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. I think it's a total hit. I think he's extremely intelligent, very smart. And also, I was refreshing Amazon last night, and there are some very, very kind people saying, Nathan, we feel like this book is a new, refreshed version of Four Hour Work Week, which is the ultimate compliment. And that book did sort of lead the way to toward what it is that you're doing today. 100%. Tim is a genius. Yeah. Okay, second, who are your favorite CEOs, the ones you follow above all others? They're all dead. Uh, and I love dead CEOs better than alive ones because their history is there, right? You can read the whole thing. So some of my favorite biographies to read are maybe Ted Turner, how he launched CNN, or Red McCombs and how he got rich off four dealerships in San Antonio. I love reading these biographies from kind of famous dead CEOs. Ted's not dead. Well, uh, almost dead. Sorry, Ted. 
He's, I hope he doesn't listen to this. He's going to kill me. Uh, well, well, Ted, uh, you know, you're welcome to come on and strangle this guy. Okay. If you exclude software as a service, what is the industry that you most enjoy following? Oh, interesting. Um, media, to be frank. I think every person today, when you have your own company, you are also a media brand. I mean, that's why I've launched mm -hmm. a podcast. Launched a book. I have a magazine at nathanlacka.com forward slash magazine. If you don't control your message and brand yourself, somebody else will, and that's very dangerous today. How many hours do you sleep? Oh, at least eight and a half. Very good sleeper. And this is where my questions really get tougher than yours. And how okay. many hours did you sleep before you adopted the practices that you describe in your book? Well, this would have been kind of college architecture major, where pulling all-nighters was almost celebrated. Didn't make any sense to me. Just because I got less sleep didn't mean I was going to get higher grades. And it certainly doesn't mean you're better in the workplace. So I would say four or five hours of sleep as a student, that's all I was getting. How many hours a day do you not think about business? Well, for me, business, Ray, is a big board game. And once I win one board game, I find a new business board game to play. So I look at kind of each industry as a board game. You have to study the rules, understand how they work, and then understand which ones to break to get a competitive advantage. And so um, I'm always thinking about something business related, I would say. Nine years ago, your 20-year-old self wanted to be a billionaire by what age? 35. OK. Your 29-year-old self, which is you today, Knowing what you know now would feel that you had missed your mark if you failed to become a billionaire by what age? 35. <laughs> okay. I assume you're making a serious headway in that, well, in that well, regard. Here's what, I would, here's what I would tell you. Compound interest is a powerful thing. Yes, it is. So the fact that I got started at 20, and remember, I interview now almost 20 to 30 CEOs every week, because I, because just because I record in the week and release one per day on the podcast. So we have incredible momentum now. The hardest million to make is the first million, and turning a million into a billion, I think, is actually fairly easy. The way I'll do it will be through my database at gitlatka.com, where I buy and sell software companies at scale. Yeah, it's the data, stupid. It's the data, stupid. Yeah. It's a really useful book, and I think equally so for millennials who want to start up something, and those of us who are older and trying to understand the new economy. I'm one of them. How to be a capitalist without any capital. I'll be flipping through these pages often. Continued success, Nathan. Ray, thank you so much. Thank you.